Good evening, everyone. I'm Judith Erika Magyar, the country representative of EuroAccess Japan. I would like to welcome all of you in the fifth lap of our EuroAccess Me webinar series. This evening, our guests are Guzal Sultankojeva and Tomasz Kalman, who are going to talk about their research topics. Our first presenter today is Tomasz. So I'm going to give you um, presentation rights. One second. There you go. All right. Um, so thank you very much, Judith, for the opportunity and for all of you for listening to what I have to say uh, about my research. So this falls in the, oh, I was supposed to turn this off just in, yes. This falls in the realm of pure mathematics. Um, so the title was Knots, Graphs, and Polynomials. And this is a research project that I've been involved for the better part of the last 10 years. Uh, if I have to summarize it really quickly, then uh, it, it starts with, with a problem in topology, more specifically in knot theory, which we partially managed to answer in joint work with uh, Hitoshi Murakami and Alex Fosnikov. And I know that doesn't sound like much, but the good news is that while we were working on this problem, we managed to open up uh, a whole new area of combinatorics, more specifically uh, graph theory. So let me tell you a few of the details, starting from the topological side of things. So what is not theory? Uh, it's, it is about uh, simple closed curves in regular three-dimensional space, which we consider up to deformations. So on this slide, uh, you can see the simplest possible example, the so-called trivial knot or on a knot, um, which uh, is for us the same as the same curve if you just kind of bend it a little bit. However, it is not the same as the one uh, drawn right next to it, where there is actually some knotting going on. So at this point, maybe I should, I should really say that in order to physically imagine what these objects are, you should picture a piece of string that you tie into an interesting knot, and then you fuse the two ends of the string together so that you are not able to separate that anymore. In that way, it turns out that there are infinitely many ways of making different knots, and what knot theory is about is to sort them out, to classify them, to just, just figure out what are these ways, all the different ways of making a knot. Uh, this field also studies links, which are just uh, finite unions of knots that can, of course, be tangled together in all kinds of interesting ways. So this is roughly what this is about. Um, and then one wonders how to get any control over this seemingly impossible complexity. And let me just mention one of the, those ways. There are actually dozens, dozens of methods of in, imposing some kind of order on, on these knots. One of them is this Humphrey polynomial. Well, it's a two-variable polynomial. If you care about such details, then it's actually a so-called Laurent polynomial. So negative exponents are OK. Uh, and it's based on some really simple rules. Indeed, this is supposed to be invariant under the deformations. To the most to the trivial knot, this very simple little closed curve, you assign the value of one. And then if you make certain local modifications to your curves, then it's the polynomial changes in uh, this predictable way governed by the so-called skein relation. Well, uh, let me just show you an example of what this looks like. I will not be able to take you uh, through all the steps of this computation, but um, hopefully this slide will convince you that this is completely mechanical. You just start with a curve, a representation of your curve, usually some sort of planar drawing, and then you just sort of start, you just make a few modifications to it. it the computation kind of branches, but then eventually you, you, all the branches of the computation lead the trivial knot where you know that the value is equal to one, and then you work your way back to the original curve and you read up a value. 
Uh, so indeed, please do take my word for it, that this is simple enough to do. Uh, it's mechanical, anyone can do it basically. Uh, however, a conceptual understanding of what is going on in this computation has not emerged until about two years ago. So by now, there is some, there's, there, there has been a conjecture uh, coming from theoretical physics that has been rigorously verified by two of my colleagues, uh, Tobias Ekholm and Vivek Shende. Uh, so now we have a, a little bit of an understanding of what this really is, but it's, it's actually really complicated. So let me actually talk about something less ambitious. Not a full understanding of this thing called the Humphrey polynomial, only a part of it and only for only in special situations. So how do graphs come into this picture? Well, uh, there's a, an interesting little method of constructing a knot or link from a graph. And on this slide, I'm showing an example of that. Uh, you take a graph, you make a planar drawing of it. So in this drawing, the edges do not cross each other on, on the paper where you draw them. And then you follow this graph around with a curve, which you can see on the right side of my um, of my slide. Well, the rule is that you put a little disk around each vertex of the graph, and then every edge of the graph becomes this kind of half twist that connects the, the two neighboring disks. So you sort of neatly draw this curve following the graph. There is a particular way of doing that. The technical words are written here, so that uh, in what I'm talking about, G is assumed to be a connected and bipartite graph, and the resulting knot is a so-called positive alternating well, uh, link. So we've got that. And then there are some indications in the literature um, by some people suggesting that uh, when, you, when I look at the Humphrey polynomial evaluated on this kind of curve, the specially constructed knot, then the top coefficients of that polynomial will be something quite nice and interesting that you can express easily, or maybe not so easily, but neatly in, in terms of the original graph. So here's an example. If I start from the graph that I, that I showed you and I construct my knot, then well, the Humphrey polynomial comes out to this nine-term formula uh, in that mechanical way that I showed you before you can totally compute this and along the top of that there are these three numbers by top actually i mean um, those terms in the expression where the exponent of the variable z is the highest so there are three terms in this in my example that contain the the term z cubed and uh, they have certain coefficients one three and three in this case so the goal is really to explain what these numbers are in this example, one, three, and three. And well, in general, for any graph, what are they? Well, it takes a little bit of graph theory uh, to give that description. But if, if you have a graph, then you may talk about its spanning trees. The, uh, these are the connected and cycle-free subgraphs of that structure. Um, well, and then you can sort of uh, coarsen this notion into a hypertree, which means that you only, well, this is a so-called bipartite graph. So as you can see, it has blue and green vertices. And they are, if there is a connection between two vertices, that's always between blue and green. Now you look at only the green vertices, and then you just write down how many edges of the spanning tree they are connected to. By the way, I hope that this, this thing is, was not blocking half of my slide for you guys all the time. Well, now it's, um, well, now, now you can, well, anyhow, yeah. So the so hypertree is just a count of how many edges of the spanning tree are incident to any of the uh, green vertices. And for some technical silly reasons, you subtract one from that value. So that's, that's all that you keep track of. Now, there's a certain interesting notion, and this is really the heart of this talk, because this is what I came up with, at least at this level of generality, 
I defined the relation of activity between hypertrees, these interesting sort of degree distributions, and uh, elements of E, these green vertices. And I call one of these green vertices active for that hypertree if it is not possible to reduce the value of the hypertree at that vertex EI and uh, subsequently add a one to the value of the hypertree at a smaller index so that the result, this modified list of numbers, is also a hypertree. So if I cannot do that, then I call my element of my green vertex active for that hypertree. Well, uh, for each hypertree, you can count how many elements of E have this status. Matter of fact, I will count those elements of E which do not have that status, the complementer set, those that are not active. And I just gather this information in a so-called generating function. So this is uh, well, what, what it is. Uh, maybe uh, in the on the next slide there will be an example. Anyhow, uh, I call this the interior polynomial associated to this graph G. Here is indeed an example. So in, in what I use as a running example, turns out you can construct seven hypertrees. This was the one that I showed on the previous slide. There are six others, so by symmetry, you can construct these five others. They are just permutations of the previous. Turns out that there is a seventh one like this. Well, you can just follow the word of my definition and uh, figure out which of the three elements, which, uh, which, are, which of the three green vertices uh, has this active status or not active status. Then, then you see that each of these have, makes this uh, contribution as it is written on the bottom line or almost the bottom line. And then you just sum them up. So you, you get one, three, and three, just like before, because that's exactly the, the fact, the pattern um, that I was talking about. But first of all, maybe I should say that my expression called the interior polynomial does not depend on how the set, set E was actually labeled. That's, that's a very important technical point here. But more, even more importantly, uh, this interior polynomial doesn't change even if we change our minds and repeat our computation not with the green but the blue vertices. Uh, this is a rather interesting fact, I would say. And then finally, uh, there does exist the connection that I promised to the Humphrey polynomial. So when G is a planar graph, so that I can construct that associated knot from it and I can talk about the Humphrey polynomial of that knot, then the top of this Humphrey polynomial has the same coefficients, exact same numbers, as the coefficients in this uh, interior polynomial. So there's this, this does give uh, a combinatorial answer to, this, to the original question about the Humphrey polynomial. So now that I turn out I have, to have two more minutes, let me say a few more words about where, how this story continues. So yes, in, indeed inspired by some knot theory, we came up with this new notion uh, this new polynomial that you can associate to graphs and try to understand the structure of graphs using that new notion. And you can do even better, it turns out. Um, so what I called active so far is really called internally active, that's what I have always called it, because there's a pair of that notion, external activity. It's, it's a very similar sounding notion, let me not go into the details of the definition. And then what you can do uh, with this this pair of notions is you can, for each hypertree, you can count how many of it, how many, how many green vertices have one, of, one status internally active, but not the other status, they are not externally active. You can also count those which happen to uh, have the opposite status, externally active, but internally not active. And then you can also count those elements of E which, have, which are active in both senses. And then you can write this fantastic expression. Uh, you can put the only internally active count uh, into the exponent of x, only external into the exponent of y, and then this is the funky part. Uh, the in those the count of those elements which are active in both senses become the so that count becomes the exponent of x plus one minus x plus y minus one. Turns out that this is exactly what you need to do for certain purposes, for example, to get something that does not depend on the labeling. This is, in fact, uh, a result that we came up with last year with uh, Alex Posnikov and Olivier Bernardi. 
Um, and the story does go on uh, to other structures called polymatrix, but I suppose that will be uh, a topic of some, some other presentation, not today. So uh, I stop here and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the very informative presentation again on knots, graphs and polynomials. I can't actually pretend to know a lot about it myself, but I would like to encourage our researchers to pose questions to Tamash. Um, you can type your questions in the questions panel. Okay, again, if um, there are any questions. Yes, I see one. Okay, what do you see as the next step in this investigation and research? Well, there are quite a few uh, next steps that, that I can think of. Well, uh, so what I, for example, what I outlined today was a certain formula for uh, some of the extreme coefficients of, of this uh, polynomial. So if I may uh, go back up maybe to the example of this, yes, right here, the polynomial itself. Well, it's got a bunch of other coefficients as well. <laughs> so for example, uh, these coefficients right along this land edge uh, also seem to have a very well behaved combinatorial pattern, uh, which surprisingly we are still in the process of figuring out, not to mention then uh, to produce formulas for the entire thing, which, you know, it, it should be completely possible since the link is derived from the graph and, and the whole thing is rather combinatorial in nature, so it should be possible to write a formula that produces the entire Humphrey polynomial. That's something that I would very much like to do. And indeed, uh, those other things I mentioned with the two variable invariant associated two bipartite graphs, uh, that's part of the effort. So well, we are hoping to use that, that two variable with the variables X and Y in that. So in there, so that, that's polynomial to uh, you know, produce uh, a formula for the uh, Humphrey polynomial in knot theory. And that's one of the possible directions I can see. Thank you very much. Okay, anyone else would like to pose a question? We still have time for um, one question, if anyone would like to ask anything. Okay, in case you have any further questions, please write them uh, to japan at eurocess.net. Thank you very much, Damash, again, very Thank informative. You. And I'd like to invite Gazal to give her presentation about post-graduation intentions of international students in Japan, a survey. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, let me tell you about my research. It's an ongoing research um, and analysis is still going on. And um, today I'm going to talk about um, the results that we have so far. And the main topic is post-graduation intentions of international students in Japan. And what I'm going to present today is based on a survey that we conducted in Japan. And I'm going to tell you more about it in a second. So. 
the outline of today's presentation, I will first talk about the background of the topic, and then um, I'll tell you a little bit about research design, and then we're going to talk about the results of the survey. First, uh, we will touch a little bit why students come to Japan in the first place to study, and then um, who stays on in Japan among those students. Um, so here, um, this graph just shows you to give you a global picture how um, number of international students globally has increased since 1975. And as you can see, the, the big, the great increase was from 1995. It was a huge uh, jump here. From, uh, from the year 2010, uh, it, uh, increase has been continuing, um, but it has been on a um, uh, more moderate rate. And this was basically, uh, ex this is basically explained by um, development and uh, expansion of online study uh, programs. And um, right now, the forecasts are that it's still going to continue like that. Uh, and especially with Corona right now, where online studying has become main thing, um, it's probably going to continue um, in the same way. Um, so if you talk about Japan in particular, Japan is relatively new player in the labor market. And um, it's also new player in international um, uh education market um immigration rates in japan are one of the lowest among all oecd countries um uh, and most recent numbers in 2020 for example uh the, the numbers that were published in 2020 was that uh immigrants made up only two percent of um population in general. And Japan is also one of the countries that has um, big labor sh force shortages which are um basically the result of um low birth rates and um which has been continuing for the long time so japan needs labor and there are different ways on how to get that labor force and one of the ways is to get more immigrants right and um the way that japan generally chose was to get um more highly skilled immigrants to focus on the highly skilled immigrants and students are considered to be um one of the source of these highly skilled immigrants and they are considered to be uh, potential highly skilled immigrants. So once they graduate, they can um, join highly skilled immigrant group. Um, talking about uh, Japanese government policy towards international students, there are two main stages. In the year of 1983, um, there was announcement of the plan to accept 10, 100,000 international students by the beginning of 21st century. And this goal was achieved in 2003. And um, in the year of 2008, there was a new plan. And uh, that plan was to accept um, 300,000 international students by 2020. And now I'm going to show you a graph where you can see how this is all um, happening. Um, here you can see that international stu student numbers hasn't been increasing that much since 1980, from 1978 until somewhere here in 2000. So in 2000, as you can see, the goal wasn't really reached, the goal of 100,000 students. And then there was a, a big jump, and then the goal was uh, reached here in 2003. And then since then, you can see that the numbers has been, have been increasing. And here in 2011, you can also see a, uh, a small, well, uh, relatively um, small uh, jump, I think. But basically, this is explained with the uh, way that statistics was, uh, st uh, the way of um, calculating the number of international students has been um, changed a little bit. Um, before 2011, Japanese language uh, school students were not considered to be in statistics for international uh, students, but starting from this date, they have uh, they have started to be included. And as you can see, the latest number shows that um, Japan is very close to 300,000 um, goal. Um, in 2018, it was 298. Um, not sure about the numbers this year with Corona, it might have been changed, but I think it's a different topic to talk about. Um, so basically, uh, international students in Japan play um, a very interesting role. Um, their role in the international, in Japanese labor market um, has um, two um, interesting aspects. First of them is that they can be low skilled labor during their study in Japan. So um, with the student visa, students can work up to 28 hours per week um, during their school term. So during um, the, um, when school is on and when school is off or during their school breaks, they can work 40, up to 40 hours per week or eight hours per day, whichever they choose. So um, the ones who have been in Japan for some time, we, we have been observing that uh, even in like convenience stores in some low labor um, 
uh, low labor force skilled areas, we can see some international students being um, engaged there. So this is one of the niche niches that um, international students were have been filling. And then another one is um, that they are potential highly skilled Im immigrants after graduation. And this is not only Japan, but a lot of countries have been paying more attention to this and they have been trying to retain international students after they graduate. Um, from the universities in their country. And the things that Japan has done on the policy level is, one of them is they have introduced one year designated activities visa, which is basically a visa that you get for six months and you can prolong it for another six months if you can prove that you have been um, job hunting. Um, so this gives opportunity for international students uh, to have an extra time, to have an extra year to do their job hunting, to, to find the work that um, is good for them and um, if they wish to stay in Japan. And also another um, policy um, that has been introduced was that um, there has been, there, there's a new um, visa type called highly skilled visa. It was introduced in 2012 and then um, changed uh, gradually since then. But basically, if you, if you are a graduate from uh, Japanese university, you get some extra points. And if you're master or PhD, you get some extra points again. So these are some of the advantages that international students who, who have graduated in Japan get um, compared to other um, job seekers in general. Um, so my research question um, coming from all of this is why do international students decide to stay in Japan? And also how to retain those international students in Japan. The answering question, why do international students stay, will help to answer the question how to help them stay, how to retain them so they can be highly skilled migrants after their graduation. Um, what, we, what I did with my research is that um, um, I did an online survey and we uh, focused on six Japanese universities. Um, the way we chose them was um, we looked at the top, uh, the numbers of international students and we chose the ones that had uh, the most of the numbers. Um, in the Kanto region, um, it was Waseda University and Tokyo University. We also tried to uh, choose different regions and from each region we chose one uh, private and one public university. So Waseda is um, private university and Tokyo University is public university. Same thing for Kansai region, Osaka University is a public university and Doshisha is a private. Um, in Kyushu re region, we chose Ritsume Kanijan Pacific University and Kyushu University, one private and one uh, public university. So here you can see um, the respondents by university. Um, in total, we had um, 574 respondents and 530 um, co completed responses. Um, questionnaire was distributed both in English and Japanese, but most of the um, responses were in, um, in English. Um, respondents represented 85 different nationalities, so we had quite big variety, and 75, but at the same time, 75% of respondents were from Asian continent, which is understandable, and it, it is, um, um, it's the same as uh, official statistics um, for students in general. A, a lot of students in Japan come from Asia. So if you look at the um, country of origin of international students, you can quickly see it in, in this picture. Um, the age of the respondents was average 23. Um, majority were single without children and um, um, uh, the, the distribution between female and male were, was almost the same. We had 255 female and 275 male respondents. So talking about the results, um, there were different uh, options that uh, uh, students answering the questionnaire could choose. And the basic, the, the question was, what do you intend to do? What's your plan to do? And they also had an answer where they could say, I'm undecided. And as you can see, it's number nine. And most of the students said, they undecided, and which is understandable. Um, for the, in, the the question of our interest, if students plan to stay on in Japan, um, I would like you to pay attention to um, to uh, question number two, uh, to the column number two and number six. Um, two is I plan to work in Japan. I intend to work in Japan after graduation. And six is I, I intend to um, study in Japan after graduation. And um, these are the numbers. Um, and if you sum up these two, it, they would make um, about 30% of the total respondents, which is also um, quite uh, consistent with um, the results that um, the official uh, numbers, officially as well, about 30% of the students stay in Japan after they graduate. Um, here we can see the difference between uh, female respondents and male respondents. What is interesting here is that um, this one on the left is female respondents and this one on the left, on the right is male. Um, more um, 
male respondents, uh, again, we are looking at two and six, um, more male respondents said that they are planning to stay in Japan, and more female respondents said they are planning to work home. Um, this could be explained with many different um, um, aspects, and uh, gender and migration has been, has been a very interesting topic. Um, so, um, and uh, there is specific um, trend among Asian um, students um, related to culture, maybe related to different things, but this is one of the interesting observations we have so far um, from our um, data. So, for the question, why did you choose to study in Japan? Um, here, uh, you can see different answers and how respondents replied. The top one was culture interest. Um, more than 50% of the people said that um, it strongly applies or applies to their case. Uh, they were interested in culture to come to Japan. Also, top quality education, education valued in my home country. I want to stay short, short term after graduation and I want to stay long term after graduation were some of the reasons why students wanted to come wanted to come to Japan to study as well, which was very interesting too. Um, we can also see other results, but out of these um, answers, cultural interest, short term stay after and long term long term stay after were of particular interest to us. So we decided to um, um, check them a bit more. So here you can see um, how students um, who said um, here you can see post-graduation choices and reason to come to Japan because they're interested in culture. Um, you can see that um, a very small number of people who said um, I'm not interested in culture at all um, wanted to stay in Japan. So there should be some interest in culture so they wanted to stay but um, on other answers uh, they are pretty much the same, they're like about 30%, so it's very inconclusive. We can't really say that the stronger they are interested in culture, the higher their um, intention to stay. So um, here is uh, something even more interesting. Here we can see that this is a short term, um, these are the people who wanted to stay, who came to Japan to study because they wanted to stay in Japan for short term initially, and this one is the long term initially. And as you can see, uh, the number of students who, had, who decided to stay um, in Japan, um, the share of students increases as uh, their um, the strength of uh, how much they want, how they said this statement applies to them. So um, intention in the beginning, it seems, is a very important factor um, when students come to Japan. And one of the things is that it's really hard to get um, work visa to Japan. So if people wanted to come to Japan and stay for some time to work or maybe to leave, um, it seems like student visa might be one of the ways. So they come here to study and then maybe stay here for short term or for the long term. Um, another thing that was interesting for us is their Japanese ability. And um, here, as you can see, um, this green one is people, oh, sorry, green, this blue one, uh, the people who said um, they plan to stay in Japan to work or study. The higher, generally what we observe is that the higher the level of Japanese, um, the more uh, the share of students who, who are saying that they want to stay in Japan. Um, further. Um, here is intention to stay and satis satisfaction from study. Here as well we can see that the more students are satisfied from their study, the more um, um, they intend to stay. The, for the people who were not satisfied at all or were more unsatisfied, the, the share of people who wanted to stay is very low. Um, another thing is scholarship. So um, we had about 43 people who said, I plan to go back home for sure. They were not undecided. And only 10 of them didn't have any obligation bound by scholarship. So scholarship obligation is a big thing and it's a legal obligation. So it's understandable that those people cannot stay in Japan. They would want to go back home. So this is the end of my presentation. Um, if, uh, as you can see, um, there are still a lot of uh, things that um, one could um, research more about. We also looked at um, length of stay in Japan and if that has any impact on their um, uh, decision to stay after graduation or not. And it didn't seem to have any impact um, across different years of stay in Japan. Um, so if you have any more questions or if you are interested to know more about my research, feel free to email me or find me on LinkedIn and I'll be happy to um, get in touch with you and tell you more about my research. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Gisel. That was a very, very interesting. Okay, uh, so at this point, I would like to encourage uh, our audience to actually 
type their questions in the questions panel. Okay, anyone? Let's see. Okay, it says, um, what area of origin and tendency to want to stay um, trend did you find in the data, if any? Okay, so one more time. What area of origin and tendency to want to stay trends did you find in the data, if any? I... Um... I think the question is asking if some um, countries of origin were more inclined to stay compared to some other countries of origin. And this is a very interesting question. Um, I am still researching about this. Um, general um, scholarship says that uh, students from developing countries tend to stay, um, their tendency to stay in developed countries is higher compared to students from developed country. Um, I can't really tell you um, the exact result yet, and one of the reasons for that is because, as I said, my um, my um, group is very diverse, but some of the group have a really like small number of respondents. So if it's conclusive or not is another question. So I think I'll be able to answer that um, a bit further down my research. Thank you. That's a very interesting question, though. Thank you so much. Okay, our next question coming up. Do you think there are any differences in the intentions of students depending on their year of study? For example, are the opinions of first year undergraduates different than those of fourth year undergraduates? Um, that's a very, very good question as well. As I said, uh, we tried to look at um, the year, um, for how many years they have been in Japan and their intentions to stay. And it seemed that uh, students who were in their fourth year or fifth year um, had a bit more um, clear plans compared to other groups, but it's it's still a bit not very conclusive. Um, so I, I don't want to say something for sure. Um, my expectation was that um, because in Japan, um, very often when you're in the third year or in the fourth year, you start doing your job hunting and you start deciding if you want to stay or not, um, that students would have a bit more clear picture about their future. Um, but uh, for now, the results are a bit inconclusive. We can't really say that uh, students um, who have been here for, like, say, five years really want to stay, or students who have been here for, for two years, um, they don't. Uh, one thing that we found, though, is that students who were here less than two years, they, a lot of them were undecided, and that's understandable, right? That's because they have just started their, their study and they, they haven't thought about that yet. So. Thank you so much. Okay, any further questions? Yes. In one of your graphs regarding Japanese language ability, the higher the ability, the more likely people are to stay. However, the graph stops at about 40% with native Japanese ability wanting to stay. How does this compare with other countries, for example, the USA, Germany, or France? I think um, it's a bit difficult to compare with USA because uh, USA is an English native speaking country and you have to be able to speak English to, to go to, to USA and study basically. And Japan is a bit different case. I, I think you can compare it to Korea maybe, um, but Korea is also like one of the new um, um, players in international um, education market, right? So it's, it's a very different case if you are studying in a um, in a program that's not native language of the country, of your host country. And this is the case in Japan, right? You're basically studying in English, your programs are in English, but the native language of the country is Japanese, right? So the, the, the real question is, yes, you can maybe, you can uh, very likely 
complete your education here successfully, but can you also live and work here successfully? And would you be willing to do that, right? So um, with the native uh, um, native level um, people, it's a very, very good observation. I think um, for everyone whose native language is not Japanese, they basically um, choose different levels from N5 to N1. Um, for the ones who chose that they, they have native level Japanese, their story is a bit different story. So I think those people consider them, those students consider themselves as international students, but they have been, they probably have been raised in Japan or they have permanent visa. So for them, the story might be a little bit different. Um, and um, I think uh, it's, it's, it's really good observation that you mentioned, that you noticed that I think for, the, for that group that said they're native uh, Japanese speakers, they basically have more choices and they don't have to decide right now. They can decide also later because visa is not an issue for many of them. Um, for a lot of international students, visa is an issue. So this is why they have to decide while they're still studying what they want to do. Um, because once they leave, it, coming back is going to be harder, basically. Thank you so much. Again, that's a very interesting observation. Uh, any further questions? We still have uh, time for one question at least. Yes. Okay. Um, do you find recent influences because of COVID-19? That's a really, really good and really, really difficult question. I think COVID is definitely going to impact not only students, but everyone. Um, a lot of students uh, were not able to come to Japan in April because of Corona. So um, it's um, um, for my research, particularly, the survey was done long before Corona. So um, I don't think it's gonna be, we're going to see any um, impact of Corona in my uh, results of my research. But I think um, the, the world is going to be different um, after Corona, and a lot of educational institutions are now offering online classes. I study at Vassad, and our classes have been online as well. So um, I think education market in general is going to change, um, and we will have to adjust to what Corona will bring to us. So I, I, I don't want to make any forecasts, but it will definitely affect um, international student market, labor markets, and um, a lot other. Uh, um, spheres of economy as well. Thank you so much. I'm afraid that is all um, we've had time for today. Uh, I would like to I would like to thank our uh, presenters uh, for their participation. And I would like to encourage our attendees to propose any topics that they would like to talk about in our webinar series, um, you might like to send us an email to japan at uraccess.net. The webinar has been recorded and it will be made available on the YouTube Uraccess Japan website. Thank you again for coming. Guzal and thank Tamash, you so thank you for your uh, contribution today. And I would like to wish all of you a very good evening or a good day, wherever you may be. Thank you. Bye-bye. You too. Bye.